Okay, Dever Davis. Dever, Dever has a PhD with a master's in public health. She's an award-winning writer and scientist. Uh, she received the National Book Award for her first nonfiction book, When Smoke Ran Like Water, which was the subject of several award-winning documentaries by the Weather Channel, BBC History, BBC New Nova, as well as U.S. Public Television, WQED Pittsburgh. Her other documentary film work includes Exposure, Environmental Links to Breast Cancer, and a uh, winner of the New York Film Festival Science Documentary Award, Journal of Planet Earth with Matt Damon for PBS, produced by Marilyn and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so Dever here is to uh, tell us about uh, an update on cell phones and our health. There's over six billion cell phones on the planet now. So we are in the largest experiment that we humans have ever gone through with cell phones. So I think this is an extremely important topic and we've, we're really uh, happy and uh, look forward to hearing what Dever has to tell us about it. Thank you. Thank you. Are we on? Thank you all very much and I want to thank my good friend Susan for inviting me to, to speak with you tonight on a topic of great interest. But before I do that, I want to tell you, I just came from Jackson Hole, Wyoming, and we have eight feet of snow in one week. <coughs> so anybody that's interested in skiing, you now have nonstop service from San Francisco to Jackson. It just started, and it's pretty amazing, I have to say. So I just couldn't resist a commercial message. It's quite a strange change for me to come back to the flatland from being in this gorgeous mountain place where I get to live and where Environmental Health Trust is, is based and where the mayor and the town council in 2010 unanimously passed the cell phone safety declaration. Simply saying, people have a right to know that a cell phone is a two-way microwave radio. It doesn't seem like such a radical idea. And if you know it, then you'll be smarter about how you use it. So what we're promoting at Environmental Health Trust is what we call practice safe tech and we've got some racy cards here that we've been handing out, and I'm looking for some of them. Um, well, we'll put here. And you can just distribute these. Okay. Yes, would you? And you can tell me which ones you like better. We have the one, the sort of Valentine one, and then we have this racy one with the shoe. And no, that's not my foot. I, these are my highest heels. Um, <clears throat> it says, do it with wires. Practice safe tech. And the idea is, we're not anti-technology, we're just pro-safety. And there's ways to make technology safer and smarter, and I'm gonna talk with you about why we need to do that and why we all need to work together on this issue. <clears throat> In my talk today, I'm gonna to first describe what is cell phone radiation. I'd like to know how many electrical engineers do we have in the room? All right, and how many people with biological training? Okay. And one or two with both, okay. I'm going to review in vitro and in vivo evidence on health impacts. I'm talking about sperm damage, prenatal impacts, and impacts on brain structure and function. I'm gonna talk about human studies, including case reports, cross-sectional and epidemiologic studies, <clears throat> case reports on breast cancer, head and brain tumors, hearing loss and damage I'll briefly mention. And then finally, I'll share with you some expert advice that's been developed by physicians and neurosurgeons with whom I'm privileged to work and these pamphlets are available over there. Um, we also make them available in bulk copies. And any of you that would like to distribute them to your clinical practices, or friends, or family, please do so. All of these materials are available for downloads on our website. And uh, we're trying to work constructively to get information out so that people can be smarter um, about how they use these devices. <clears throat> now, briefly, the electromagnetic spectrum really goes all the way from the kinds of gamma and cosmic rays that we know are out there in outer space here, to X-rays, to UV, to visible light, and then there is the band of microwave radiation, which is the same, <clears throat> the same frequency for a microwave oven and a cell phone, basically, but a microwave oven has a thousand watts of power, so it can boil a cup of water in about a minute. And a cell phone has 
on average, are actually much less than one watt of power, maybe even 0 0.2, 0 0.1. So what's the, what's the difference? Well, <clears throat> you can't cook anything with a cell phone, contrary to that um, phony commercial about popcorns with cell phones that you don't do with that. You can't pop popcorn. But it's not necessarily the frequency of the cell phone. I'm sorry, it's not the power of the cell phone that may be the most biologically important part. The frequency and its modulation of frequency may be most important. Cell phones emit pulsed microwave radiation. It's not continuous. It's pulsed. It's erratic. In fact, most phones in America are programmed to seek a signal from the tower every 900 milliseconds. In Europe, I understand they're programmed to seek it less frequently, by the way. So part of this great demand that we have, and it's a growing demand, on our networks and dropped calls, et cetera, comes from the fact that our devices are programmed to be looking for a signal all the time, and erratically. And that erratic signal may be what's most biologically important. Cell phone radiation is too weak to damage DNA the way that ionizing radiation does. But it does damage DNA. That's the kicker. And I'm going to show you some of the evidence on that now. We look at radiation from a cell phone, we have to ask about its frequency, its amplitude, its pulse, and the information content. And all of these are relevant. And you can see here, in a four-second phone call, I want you to look at the change in power density, measured as volts per meter, in just four seconds. And again, it's the change over time, the delta, if you will, over time, that may be more biologically important. This is just four seconds of a call here. Standby, not much. Ringing. The worst time to put a phone right next to your head is when you answer it. It goes to max power to make sure you got a good connection. And that's when you don't want to put it right next to your head. Say, always say hello. And you can use it with a headset. You couldn't find my headset in there either, the, hand, the blue handset. Um, that allows you to hear better. Um, and there are a number of, yes, Lloyd, my, there you go. <laughs> OK. All right. And uh, <clears throat> thank you. Thank you. That's my fan of white there. Well, he's got the white hair anyhow. Right. Lloyd Morgan is my uh, trusted uh, advisor and a member of our EHT team. And I'm just going to make sure that I'm on airplane mode, which is what I advise all of you to do. And I'll tell you a funny story. <clears throat> if you're trying to use this phone and it's really cold out, and you keep it in, um, on regular power, it will drain the battery because it's trying to stay warm. That's what it's, it's programmed to do. So if you're ever out in cold, cold weather, you should definitely put it on airplane mode and then put it close to your body to keep it warm because a cold battery will drain. That's just part of the way they work. Airplane mode means it's neither getting nor sending microwave radiation. So it means for right now, uh, those of you here who are presumably here to listen and talk with us, you want to be on airplane mode anyhow, right? And this headset allows you to answer the phone. And for old people like me, I can actually hear with it. Uh, it's made by a company called Talk On, which has some presence here in the Silicon Valley and also is based uh, in Israel. But the point of this slide here is to show you how much change there is over such a, and this is, again, four seconds. And this up and down and up and down and up and down is what we believe is explaining some of the results I'm going to show you next. Some of the am amazing findings of in vitro effects in cell cultures, in vivo effects in whole animals, and some of the epidemiologic studies as well. But I want you to realize one incontrover uh, incontrovertible fact. Standards for cell phones have not changed in 17 years. Would you like to fly an airplane that was flying with 17-year-old safety standards? Would you like to drive a car or have a seat belt or a bike helmet with 17-year-old safety standards? No. The FCC, on Good Friday of last year, issued a notice that it will be asking for advice on whether to change its approach to cell phones. 
Lloyd Morgan and my colleagues at Environmental Health Trust have issued a number of statements about why they do need to change their approach. And the good news is it's going to change. The bad news is it may weaken. In the name of harmonization, globalization, you've heard those phrases used. For international trade, we don't want to interfere with the United States' ability to compete. So let's lower our standards to the lowest common denominator. Um, the cell phone standards were developed to avoid heating the head of a heavy set man, not a young child. A standard anthropomorphic mannequin, we call him Sam for short, has a pretty large head. There are perhaps two or three percent of the people in this room with a head as big as Sam's. And a young child's skull is thinner, the brain contains more fluid, and they will therefore absorb more radiation. Plus, something that the standards have never taken into account, which any parent can tell you, is that children's brains are not the same as ours. They are developing more rapidly. They're not fully myelinated. And the idea that even if a child's brain absorbed the same amount of radiation, it would have the same biological effect makes no sense. It just makes no sense whatsoever. The skull bone of a child's head, the bone marrow of the skull, actually absorbs 10 times more radiation than the skull of the adult. And the brain itself, the soft, squishy tissue inside, absorbs probably twice as much radiation as that of an adult. Much of the energy is absorbed immediately in this area of the brain, and I want to concentrate on that area for you because that is the area where we are also starting to see an increase in gliomas, malignant tumors of the brain, and the other area where phone radiation is common around the cheek, the parotid gland, the acoustic neuroma, the hearing gland, trigeminal nerves. All of these are areas with a major exposure because cell phone radiation does not get through the head of an adult. It only gets in maybe two to three centimeters. And interestingly, there's a number of these gliomas, I didn't mention this to you, Lloyd, a number of these gliomas, which normally would be invasive and go into the brain, are just on the surface indicating that the exposure is right where the phones were kept by the heavy users. Now, <clears throat> we model exposure to the brain because we don't actually test people, because that would be unethical. But we are in the midst of a huge experiment on our children and grandchildren right now. We are giving cell phones to children as toys, as pacifiers. And I think, Lloyd, we forgot to bring the plastic baby iPhone rattle case. I think it's in your car. And I'm so sorry because you have to see it to believe it. I'm not making this up. There's a teething rattle case for an iPad. And it says on the case, protect the iPad from the baby's dribble and drool. <laughs> now, these devices are tested to be used 20 centimeters away from an adult body. 20 centimeters, OK? A baby's arms are not 20 centimeters long. Infants, how many of you have seen babies chewing on cell phones and their parents hand them the phones to distract them? How many of you have seen that? It's rather common. And there are apps for babies. And that's what you need the iPad for the baby for, in case you've run out of other things that you might want to give your grandchild. So these models that I show you here have been developed by the Swiss Institute that works largely with industry support. And <clears throat> what you can see here is that the exposure does go all the way through the head of the three-year-old. De and the, depending on the position, you get a difference in the amount of absorption. At Environmental Health Trust now, we're close to completing a modeling study with the chairman of the Department of Electrical Engineering at a major Brazilian university, where we're actually taking anatomically based, MRI based models of the head of a one year old, a two year old, and a three year old to measure and model their exposure. And when I proposed to the Brazilians two years ago that we do this study, they said, Why would anybody want to know about cell phone absorption into the head of an infant or a toddler? I said, well, we're the land of prosperity, and we have, unfortunately, this technological imperative which says if we can do something, we should do something. 
How else can you explain something like Google Glass? Uh, when I asked one of the senior people at Google, did any, what did anybody think about putting a microwave radiating transmitter right next to the eye or the brain, he said, what did anybody think about that? They didn't. And the fact is that we're doing amazing things in medicine with this technology today. You can take a camera, swallow it, and it can send through microwave transmissions images of, inside the body of someone that you might have, think might have cancer. That's a good thing. That's a risk-risk trade-off that's worth making because the alternative in the years past would have been to do surgery. So you can, obviously, the trade-off there is easy to make. But the idea that we're going to give our babies and toddlers these devices to teach them nursery rhymes, to sing them songs to go to sleep, or one of my favorite worst apps is an app that you put into the phone so that when the phone is under the baby's head and the baby is asleep and it starts to cry, it plays mommy's voice. Yeah, I'm not making this up, all right? Again, it's this technological imperative that I think we really need to take a step back and say, what are we doing? Does this really make sense? Is this really in our best interest? Now, the brain does grow rapidly throughout embryonic and early life. <clears throat> in fact, almost at conception, there's few brain cells. They're just cells. There's nothing else. There's no skull. There's nothing surrounding them. And throughout gestation, the brain more than doubles. And most amazing thing is that at birth, the brain will go on to more than double in the first year of life. The brain is amazing in how quickly it grows. And the brain of the neonate, the brain of the embryo, is completely without protection. There's nothing, there's no skull, there's nothing. This rapid growth is what allows us to be human, to develop all the incredible skills and talents that we have. But vulnerability to a toxic substance is a function of the rate of cell growth. The more rapidly cells grow, the greater the chance they can take in a mistake, and it goes on and it's magnified more. Radiation from the phone, as we discussed earlier with, with Jim and Steve, is absorbed into the head or body. And the energy comes from the base station in this little crude cartoon, and it's diffused. But holding a device right next to you means it's going to get into you. And the very simple solution of using a headset, using a speakerphone, putting on airplane mode, getting in the habit of actually turning it off from time to time, which is a very radical idea, I know. Those are things that can actually reduce your exposure and, by the way, make your neighbor's chance of getting a call when they need it easier. Because if we reduce the demand on the network, then things will work better when we really need them. Now, I want to talk with you about some of the experiments that have been done with human sperm. And these are effects that have nothing to do with heating. What they've done here, and I'm summarizing just a few studies, is they've taken sperm from a healthy man and put it into two test tubes. One test tube gets exposed to cell phone radiation. The other test tube does not. Remember, they, cell phone radiation does not generate heat. The results, and this is from Australia's National Center for Research on Male Health, led by um, John Aitken, who is a Cambridge University trained embryologist and expert in male health, shows that the amount of sperm in the cell phone exposed test tube from a man is reduced about threefold. The vitality of the sperm and the motility of the sperm, how well it swims, is also reduced threefold if it's been exposed to cell phone radiation. And the measures of mitochondrial DNA damage on those sperm are three to fourfold higher if the sperm is exposed to cell phone radiation versus not exposed. Now, this is a pretty stunning set of work. Now, this is not one study. We actually have a spreadsheet we're working on with colleagues at um, New York University of more than 70 studies that are related to this. And they all don't find effects. Some of them find no effect. But those that are done independently, for the most part, do find an effect. And the effect is on morphology, motility, 
vitality, various measures of sperm health. Perhaps I can tell a joke. It's late enough here in the evening. Do you know why you need 250 to 500 million sperm to make one healthy baby? You got it. They don't know how to ask for directions. <laughs> Good. Good. And actually, <clears throat> and actually, in order for a sperm to succeed in implanting an, a healthy egg, uh, fertilizing a healthy egg and having it implant in the uterus, it has to literally swim like from LA to Catalina Island. I mean, it's a long, it's a long distance, and you want the healthiest sperm to survive. Um, so the joke that uh, Stan Glantz uh, told his graduate students is, well, you might put your phone in your pocket as a form of birth control. Um, <clears throat> that's really not a good idea for a lot of reasons. Stan Glantz is a professor of biostatistics and public health at um, UCSF. And he has published uh, in his book, Biostatistics in Medicine, the seventh edition, not a very radical book, I can assure you, but Biostatistics in Medicine, the seventh edition, the last chapter explains why he has concluded that on the preponderance of the evidence, cell phone radiation does damage male reproductive health. We can discuss later why you may find that a surprising thing to hear. But the reality is this study I'm showing you here is not the only study of its kind. It exemplifies a number of other studies done one of which was done at the Cleveland Clinic. And this study from Ashok Agarwal at the Cleveland Clinic, with whom I just spoke last week, did a very interesting, clever, cross-sectional analysis. He is in charge of fertility clinics and infertility at the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, he's published over 400 articles. He noticed, starting in the 2006-07, that the guys would come into the clinic who had problems, and they often were wearing a couple devices right on their hips. So he began to collect information about this, and he asked about their use of cell phones. And he found that those who reported almost no use, nowadays that would be almost nobody, uh, had almost twice as much sperm as those who reported using it four hours a day or more. And he published these findings in a rather important journal but he has not been able to continue the work because there's no funding for it. We're trying to work with him now to raise funds for him to continue this work because it is very important. There are, it's now almost two out of every hundred births in the United States is involving some form of assisted fertility. The problems of infertility in the United States are, are increasing and very few people are asking questions about use of cell phones during pregnancy, prior to infertilization, et cetera. Now I want to share with you some data from Hugh Taylor, uh, another collaborator with Environmental Health Trust, who is the chairman of the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at Yale University Medical School. Professor Taylor has shared um, these data from a study that he published in a scientific reports, which is a nature publication, on fetal brain programming, taking 33 pregnant mice and 42 pregnant controls. Now each mouse produces between seven to 10 offspring, so you get a lot of uh, data here. And what they did is they took a silenced cell phone with the regular approved, approved FCC phone, and they positioned it right over the water bottle of the feeding cage. Have anyone here ever worked with rodents in the laboratory? They drink a lot of water. They spend a lot of time at the water bottles, okay? So you know you're getting exposure, but frankly, you're not getting a lot of exposure, you know? And it's kind of hard to get these mice to make phone calls. So what you really do is you just get general exposure uh, with, in this format. So let's just agree that the exposure was not very high. Nonetheless, what he found was that prenatally exposed mice, when they were adults, had statistically significant problems with memory, hyperactivity, and anxiety, and they had significantly less fear. Interesting. Uh, studies in humans, which I don't have the data to show you now, have been done, and what they have found is that cell phone radiation exposure makes you respond faster. You respond faster, but you make more mistakes. So think about that the next time you're on your phone in the car. Another set of studies have been done by my colleague Suleiman Kaplan at Samsung University in Turkey. 
And he has done similar work with the rats, but he does something called stereology, which looks at a three-dimensional analysis of where cells are located relative to where they should be located, what their size <coughs> is, and other measures of morphology and uh, their vitality. And the research question he's asking is, does exposure to cell phone radiation using a standard horn antenna, so there's standardized exposure, result in an effect on the hippocampus uh, and the dentate gyrus of newborn rats? Those are critical parts of the brain to balance, to thinking, to anticipation, to integration. All right? And here's what he published on the question of cell phone radiation reducing cells in the thinking part of the brain. In a journal of Elsevier called Brain Research, which has a very high impact factor, he showed that there are effects, and I'm going to show you some of the histopathological analyses. The control cells you see here, and they're fairly orderly and compact, uh, as cells are supposed to be. And this is much magnified here, a different slice. And then the exposed cells. <coughs> now, even if you're not a pathologist, you can see that there are fewer cells here, that they're more in disarray, that, they ha that the boundaries, the membranes, are actually disrupted. And that's prenatally exposed rats. They, there is a decrease in the number of hippocampus cells. So prenatal cell phone exposure does reduce the number of cells, and it might be caused by inhibition of granular cell neurogenesis. Yes, is, Jim? Is there a polarization relative to the actual flow that shows there? Hmm. So that's, yeah, no, I, that's a good question. Is there polarization? And I will ask him. Yeah, you, you know, um, hmm. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I'll, I'll share that with him and ask. So there's, he's also done studies on postnatal exposure, taking animals that were not prenatally exposed, showing a significant decrease of pyramidal cell number uh, in the EMF exposed group. So I think that this is pretty important work. Now it is experimental work, and it is working in the rat. And uh, you know how different we are from rats and mice? How many genes do we have differing from rats and mice? What percent of our genes differ? Few. Yeah. Fewer than 10%. Fewer, Fewer than 1%. 1%. Sorry. Yes. So the idea that we can dismiss these studies because they're not humans is nonsense. And I'm not going to show you today much, but we actually have human data on neurogenesis and um, measures of effects on neuronal stem cells human neuronal stem cells taken from uh, children with cancer. And we show really big effects there as well. So adult exposure, however, shows some effects that are statistically significant too, looking at um, Purkinje cell number in the female cerebellum. And these are, these are wonderful work that was done by Suleiman Kaplan, who we were able to bring here to the Commonwealth Club event that we did in December. Now, what's going on here? I don't know. But I want to speculate with you about some of the mechanisms that may be involved before I move on to some additional data. As I indicated before, younger, faster, less differentiated cells are more vulnerable. You just think about a young tree. A, a young tree that grows, if it gets knocked over, it may not survive. But a differentiated tree with many branches, you can knock off one or two branches, and it will still survive. Prepubital breast cells, fibroblast, hematocyte, neuronal stem cells, embryonic cells appear to be more vulnerable in studies that have been done thus far. What do they have in common? They have thinner membranes. They have faster transformation rates. They have greater vulnerability to shifts in extracellular matrix. So just try saying Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers really fast. That's what the cells are doing. Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers. And the faster they're growing, the greater the chance they can make a mistake. Brain cells become insulated as they mature with a fatty sheath called myelin. Myelin protects our nerve cells. 
Myelination is not really complete until adulthood. And by the way, those of us who have survived having teenage males in our families will not be surprised to learn that young men myelinate later than young women by a couple years, actually, which may account for some of the actuarial data on car crashes and other things that unfortunately happen to males more than females. They're not fully myelinated. My friend at Pittsburgh who did this brilliant work on myelination of the teenage brain came home one night and found a note from her son that said, Mom, I crashed the car, but I'm not fully myelinated. <laughs> and she said she was really not that angry because she thought, well, at least he understands my work. <laughs> the major differences in myelination, are, I think, are shown in this stunning series of images here. Um, there's almost no myelin, no protection. And then by the time of adulthood, there's, it's just a much more complex process. And uh, we can take advantage of this for some things in therapy and treatment. It may be one of the reasons why we're more successful in treating certain illnesses in children that we can't treat in adults. But it also means there's more vulnerability. And in the early, eight, early stage of what develops in the brain, this material from our colleague Mary Redmayne uh, in New Zealand shows that myelination starts here in the back and then proceeds later into the front. And of course, this is the thinking integrative part of the brain, where we anticipate and learn. Now, I think it's important when I'm showing you all of these damaging effects to show you that there are a number of studies that have found protective effects against RF radiation damage. We were talking before about chlorella and um, some of the greens. Melatonin is what you make when you sleep in the dark at night. And you're supposed to sleep in the dark at night. You're not supposed to sleep with television and radio on. You're not supposed to sleep with your iPad over your chest while you've been reading something. And if you make melatonin at night, you can actually have less damage. This is a study that was done by Shu, published in Brain Research, showing reactive oxygen species uh, which are, of course, damaging materials. Hi, Katie. Um, and what this study showed is that pretreatment with RF radiation or hydrogen peroxide prevents damage. That you, right? So it's interesting because the hydrogen peroxide story is much more complex because ingesting hydrogen peroxide might give you one set of effects, protective, but inhaling it ozone is definitely going to be bad. Now, this is one schematic developed by the Cleveland Clinic group that could explain the effects I've shown you on sperm. And they uh, have hypothesized here in a paper that was published that RF EMF could be having an effect by producing reactive oxygen species that then lead to a cascade that will stop the cell cycle and affect apoptosis. Apoptosis, of course, is cell death. You want cells to die at the right time. You don't want to have too much or too little. And this may be an effect that's going through reaction and oxygen species that will damage DNA. Remember, cell phone radiation is too weak to have a direct damage to DNA, but it can damage DNA. This may be one way it's working. We also think that there's pretty compelling evidence that cell phone radiation interferes with calcium efflux, the fundamental, fundamental process involved in cell membranes. And that that can, in turn, lead to the development of stress kinases, protein kinases, um, that will interfere with or increase the amount of heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins, of course, or um, call them chaperone uh, proteins, are involved in repair. And you need them, but again, you need the right amount at the right time. And what we see here is that heat shock proteins can stabilize the stress fiber, but it may impair the blood-brain barrier. And the blood-brain barrier of the testis, in this case, they're concerned about the testis, but the blood-brain barrier of the brain, of course, is extremely important. And anything that's going to interfere with that barrier 
can have profound biological effects, leading to abnormal motility and morphology in sperm, or leading to damage, perhaps, to the brain itself directly. John, Jim? Uh, quick question. Is the uh, 2 billion uh, polarity shifts a second able to vibrate the DNA? Because it's like a reliability tester, you know, eventually yeah. it vibrates. Well, to death. a cell phone does vibrate at about 2.4 billion cycles a second, between 900 million to 2.4 billion cycles a second. That's, that's the frequency. Um, the FDA guy who did his PhD dissertation at Maryland, May Swickard. thank you, May Swickard, in 1983, published. Um, his dissertation, and he found that that frequency was, in fact, the most uh, destructive frequency for cellular DNA. Yeah. All right? I'm not talking about the frequency, I'm talking about the polarity. So if you have a magnetic pulse that is now going positive, mm -hmm. that will charge the elements of the DNA, and then it reverses its oh. polarity, yeah. okay, that the time that it does it is frequency, but the process of it is frequency. Neutral. Neutral, yeah. yeah. Um, again, I, does anyone else have a thought about that, Steve? Well, I was I wanted to ask, if you don't mind questions in the middle of the mm -hmm. presentation. Um, you said... No, you can't ask now. You have to let me finish. No, <laughs> please. <laughs> that, please. Um, that there wasn't a, a heating effect, but um, it, it, it seems here that you're saying that there's a very clear heat shock protein effect. Yes. Um, so doesn't that mean that we're getting a molecular heating effect down at the yeah, well, it sure does. And so th that, that's, here's, here's one of the conundrums of this field, OK? When we say there are non-thermal effects, what we're really just saying is that there's no measurable change in heat that we are able to measure in the laboratory associated with this. That's what we're saying. But you're absolutely right. I think these are heat-related, but they're just not at a level of, you know, like even 0.1 degree centigrade or, or less. In fact, to complicate things more, proceeding to the National Academy of Sciences uh, two years ago, David Gultigan and Luther Mollar from uh, Lucent created an antenna that did not interfere with the experiment and measured changes in temperature uh, that did occur with a usual cell phone. Lloyd, do you want to? It's on. Is it? Okay. So with electromagnetic fields, there's a unique detector in the stress uh, gene that detects EMFs. When I first saw that, I wondered, well, what the heck could be causing that? I, I have a sort of Darwinian point of view. If, it ha if, it, if, if uh, EMFs existed during the billions of years of life's uh, evolution, then I could understand it. But there's no such thing until I thought about lightning. It's a major pulse. Do you want to, you want to pass the mic? Oh, hold on. If there's any other questions, let me know and I'll bring them mic to you. relevant to this discussion. In the next uh, heat shock protein is very much involved in cancer and it's under hypoxia inducible factor one as one of the pathways it takes, right? And that is a big factor in cancer and they're looking at methods to you know, to handle heat shock protein. I mean, you mentioned something very interesting at dinner, glutamine. And glutamine has to be one of the key components to the heat shock protein mechanism. Right. Well, let me, I have some more things to share with you, and I'm happy to take questions as, as they come up. Um, well, one of the things, Steve? I ask one more question. Sure. Um, the heat shock proteins are downstream from an iron nugget inside the DNA structure that undergoes redox changes. So I assume that there's some kind of 
change and redox potential that are associated with all these kinds of things. And I was wondering if that had been examined, whether or not the, there's an interaction between the, the incoming signal and the iron nugget in DNA to make it especially sensitive to recording those, and whether or not other things <laughs> like SOD, for example, expression, uh -huh. which would be based on that same iron nugget, whether those right. upregulate as well, along with the heat shock proteins. Well, I have some data from Ronnie Seeger of the Weizmann Institute, where he's look at, looked at superoxide dismutase and um, effects on um, various uh, detoxification pathways. And he, I think he has looked at that. And I think that is a that's a really good question, too. I think one of the things that, I, that this segues into is the following. In 2008, the US National Academy of Sciences Institute of Medicine held a workshop on research questions about cell phones and other things. 2008. You never heard of it. That workshop was almost extensively populated by non-Americans because in 2008, the United States had almost no resident experts. Frank Barnes, the Univer University of Colorado, with a notable exception. But we do not train people in bioelectromagnetics right now. We don't have doctors trained in, medicine, in electromagnetic fields. We don't have electrical engineers, except for those who are doing amazing things, developing new organs and hearts, trained in electromagnetic aspects of, in medicine. So in 2008, they got together and issued a report. And the report said, we in the United States are lacking research in a number of areas. And here's what they are. I was, as um, you didn't get to that part of the bio, but it's OK, I was a Clinton official appointee, confirmed by the Senate and all that jazz. And um, I was naive. And in 1993 to 1997, the cell phone industry partnered with our government for $27 million to have an industry government partnership to develop cell phone research. And the results of that research, which I talk about in my book, Disconnect, were exactly $27 million. 27, now, even by today's standards, that's a chunk of change. And the results started to look positive. And I talk about this in my book as well. And then the plug gets pulled on this project. <coughs> OK? Fast forward from 1997 to 2008, and I will tell you, about every 10 years, a new national commission reviews the data and says, we need more research. We need more research. But you know what? You can't do research if you don't have people trained in the basics. I mean, I'm trained in cancer epidemiology and toxicology. I was on the board of the National Toxicology Program. I was uh, appointed to head up uh, the National Commission on Hazard Investigation on Chemical Accidents. I didn't know anything about this field when I started out. All I had was a grand, brand new grandchild who could take a cell phone at eight, nine months, turn it on when it was turned off, and play Brick Breaker. He couldn't walk, he couldn't talk, but he could turn on a cell phone and play the game. Now that child now, by the way, is playing Pathetique at age eight, so he's, he's a very bright little boy, okay? Um, but the fact of the matter is that made me think about what do we know about cell phones. And then I started to look into it. And I looked into it from the perspective of someone who had been the founding director at the US National Academy of Sciences of the Board on Environmental Studies and Toxicology. Now, what did that board do? The thing you may have heard the most about is we spent four years reviewing the data on smoking and decided that you shouldn't be smoking on airplanes. We issued that report in 1986. That was a big deal. It was a very radical statement. I know it's hard to believe that it was a radical statement that you shouldn't have smoking on airplanes in 1986, but it really was. And the process of developing that report was very informative for me. I was a lot younger then. And it seemed to me that the science had been clear for decades. I mean, after all, in 1964, the US Surgeon General had issued a report saying that tobacco caused lung cancer. What logic was it that allowed us to have smoking in a small metal tube, an airplane, with recycling through the one sock for the air of the plane with 50% recycled air at all times? What was the logic to even think of the idea that you could allow smoking on planes? Well, the logic had nothing to do with health. 
It had to do with the very powerful financial interests of the advertising industry and the tobacco industry in Congress. Let me remind you that our Democratic president, Jimmy Carter, fired Joe Califano in 1978 when Califano had the nerve to suggest that tobacco was public enemy number one. Little piece of history, that's in my other book, The Secret History of the War on Cancer. That story, how in the Carter administration, which I worked in also, it seemed at one point that in order to get appointed to a high-level cabinet position, you had to be a smoker. Really, the White House was full of smoke under President Carter. And it really was a long time in coming to recognize that the science on tobacco was very compelling, and let's put that into policy. Now, moving ahead on this issue, we don't have a lot of great science. I'm showing you what I think is some of the greatest here today. But one of the things you must be aware of is that the quantity of the studies available to us is quite limited, the quantity. This, these pie charts come from a German government site called EMF Portal. You can access it yourself. And they, as, and you see the dates here, at the end of last year, they compiled all experimental studies, all experimental studies on RF and ELF, a total of 474. Now, you hear often, we have thousands of studies showing that these things are safe. That's nonsense. It's nonsense. Studies with young animals, actual real young animals, we have 797. Now, the numbers may have changed since December, but it's a pretty good guess. They haven't changed a whole lot. And the point I want to make here is we must really do what we've been saying for years and years. We must create a serious research and training program. And I want to stress the training part of it. And I have a specific suggestion of how to do that with a dollar a phone fee for the next five years two-thirds of which to be paid by industry, one-third by consumers. I don't think there's any person in this room that wouldn't spend a dollar a year to contribute to an independent training and research program. There's no question that we need it. Are there test standards coming out that people can sort of align to? Or is it still sort of DOE uh, today? I think that we're along, you know, we've got what I'm, the reason I'm here, the reason I left Jackson Hole at this time of year, <laughs> is because I really think that there are people in this room that can help make this happen. And I know you've been working on this for a long time, Jim, but there are others here who need to, under, who need to help us get the message out. This isn't a question of anti-industry. I'm very pro-industry. I use all these devices all the time. I just want them to be done, used in a smarter way. My grandchildren, they have iPads. This may shock you. But they're only allowed to use them on airplane mode, and they know what that means. So I'd prefer that they don't have them at all, by the way, and that we have more wired devices. But I think we have to be smarter about how we're using all these things. So now I want to talk briefly about the human data. Yes, go ahead. Do they use Wi-Fi? The, uh, no. The way we use it here, the good question. <clears throat> Their parents use the Wi-Fi to download whatever they want them to have on the iPad. OK, you have to, because the iPad doesn't work except with Wi-Fi, right? So they download it. They, then they, they put it on airplane mode and give it to the child to play with. All right? So it is still going to have some electromagnetic field, but it's not going to be microwave. It's going to be much lower. And they don't ever hold it on their lap. They put it on a desk. And that makes a huge difference. You know, they don't call them laptops anymore because they're really not supposed to be on your lap unless they're not on the Wi-Fi. Right? So now I want to talk a little bit about the epidemiologic studies because that's what you hear about all the time. You hear about the fact that we don't have any evidence that cell phones cause brain cancer. Well, frankly, I don't agree that that's the case, and I want to explain to you why. Most of the studies on brain cancer and cell phones are negative if you look at them like just averaging arithmetically. But every study that has been well done that looks at people who have used a cell phone for 10 years or more finds an increased risk doubled or greater. If we looked at the cohort that was exposed to the atom bombs that emitted ionizing radiation at the end of World War II, there's no increase in brain cancer in the survivors until 40 years afterwards, right? The population to show an increase, it took 40 years. 
Think about this. We have more than doubled our use of cell phones in the past five years in this country and in many countries, and, and I mean the use per minutes. The United States today is one of the heaviest users of cell phones in the world. And the absence of a global brain cancer epidemic at this time that is recognized as such is not proof of safety. And it would be foolish for us to think that it is. I want to show you some data now. I, I talked about the exposure of the parotid or salivary gland. Tumors in Israel have tripled in the past decade. And one in five is now occurring in someone under the age of 20. This is the parotid gland, all right? And because of this increase, and you can see here, there's three different major types of salivary gland tumors, and it's only this one, which is the parotid, not the submantular, or not the sublingual. And these are diagnosed by dentists for the most part. This is showing the increase, and, and Israel was at this point the heaviest users of cell phones in the world. Because of this, the Israeli Dental Association has warned that young people should limit direct exposure of the head to microwave radiation from cell phones. Now Israel, if, if you've, how many of you have ever been to Israel? You know, you know, nobody listens to anybody in Israel anyhow. Uh, they all have a direct channel to God. But the Israeli government has issued advice about reducing Wi-Fi with children and you cannot buy a cell phone in Israel without a headset or without a label for the SAR, without a label about safe use in Israel. A case, the case control study was done by Sigal Sadetsky, published in 2007, showing a significant in increase in these particular tumors of the cheek and cell phone use. And using the language of science, they concluded in 2007 that there suggests an association between cell phone use and parotid gland tumors. All right? Well, what are we doing? 2013, Leonard Hardell and his team in Sweden that have consistently produced the highest quality work on this topic in the world produced a new analysis. And they looked at what happens to people who start to use cell phones before age 20. A pretty important question. Lose cable? Um, let's check. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. All right. No, it's just the connector to the kit. Come on. <laughs> no, no. This is hard enough without paranoia. <laughs> of course, it's not paranoia if they're really trying to kill you. It makes it hard. Right? All right. Um, Hardell has le led a team of uh, really talented investigators in Sweden for a number of years. And they have now produced the first analyses ever done of people who start to use cell phones before age 20 which is, you know, is a pretty important thing for us to know in the United States. And what they found is that those who start to use cell phones before age 20, within 10 years, they have four to eight times more malignant glioma associated with the cell phone use. They've also done something very interesting on acoustic neuroma. And because they've been able, because the Scandinavian countries invented the smartphone, they invented cell phones, all right? They've been able to show among people who've used cell phones for 25 years or more that after 25 years, they have a higher risk of acoustic neuroma and larger tumors depending on the longer use of the phone. A four-fold higher risk after 25 plus years of use. So acoustic neuroma is also called vestibular schwannoma. Yeah. It's a thickening of the Schwann cells to protect the nerve but it, be, it is a tumor. In the case of acoustic neuroma, it's usually benign, but because it's in the brain and next to all those other things, it can be extremely uncomfortable, and the surgery for it can be quite problematic because there's a lot of delicate things inside there. And as a consequence, surgery can lead to hearing loss or problems with muscle control of the face and cheek. It's a hearing nerve tumor. It's, yes, it's a tumor of the hearing nerve.
Well, Susan, why don't you use the microphone? Oh, wait, well, Susan, just a second. Use the microphone. I know you know quite a bit about this now. Uh, the thing about acoustic neuroma is when it comes out of the auditory canal, um, it'll get the facial nerve, it'll get the, the acoustic nerve and a trigeminal nerve. So you can have face droop, you can have um, numbness in the face, tinnitus, hearing loss, and um, going in to crack the coconut to get them can be quite messy. Right. And there are different ways they're doing it now by going inside this way and, and through the, right, right. Now, this is just showing, displaying some of Hardell's data that I was just referring to, where he actually looked at, remember the old shoe phone, Maxwell Smart, the old brick phone, right? Those phones were like three to five watts. Those were huge in terms of the power. Those phones probably did cook your brain. You know, they, they generated, they were not in any way um, a safe. So he finds very high risks for those people who did use those old analog phones. You see that here. The digital phones, you know, it's still a twofold risk, but here with the analog phone in the highest level of use, you find a almost sixfold increase in tumors. And then the interesting thing is that the UMTS, which is the 3G, the newer system, he sees what looks like a very big risk, even for um, those who've used it um, not very much. Now, Lloyd, do you want to comment on those data? Do you have a um, All these terms like UMTS and JSM and CDMA and so on are just forms of modulation, and which is how you put information on the on the on the signal. And my own hypothesis is that what we're seeing is biological residences causing ill effects. Um, so I mean. We first think about SAR as, as, which is the amount of energy being absorbed on the, in the tissue uh, as, as a, a very important metric. And it is a very important metric. But if you were to then add in the frequency complexity, there is the power at various frequencies, knowing which frequencies were resonant, you would have a much better SAR than you do today. Of course, there is zero research going on on the biological resonance effects from electromagnetic fields. And let me just add, we at Environmental Health Trust are not just um, writing books and summarizing this material as I'm doing here today. We've actually identified some of the most brilliant people in the world doing research now, and we have research projects underway in Brazil on modeling of the brain, on analyses of brain cancer patterns in the United States in the age group 20 to 29 and 30 to 39, which is of obvious importance. And by the way, it's not easy to get those data. You might be surprised, but it is not easy to get those data. So we're really looking to partner with anyone here who's interested to expand our ability to do that kind of work. And we have actually think come up with some innovative approaches. I'll share with you some of that. But I'm sure most of you have heard repeatedly that there is no real risk of brain cancer associated with cell phones. How many of you have heard that? That they looked at it and there's nothing to it, right? Okay. Well, I want to tell you about the single most widely cited source for that. It was done by the Danish Cancer Society. By the way, a cancer society that gave me an award in 1990. I realized that was like way back when. They, however, went off to the dark side because they started a study that was called the cell phone cohort. It began with 700,000 users of cell phones in 1993 to 1995, back in ancient history of cell phone use. How many of you had a cell phone in 1993? Right, a handful, if that, OK? So that was also true in Denmark. And cell phones back then cost a lot of money. They were very expensive to use. The average call was three to six minutes, right? They started out with 700,000 users, and they took away from them all of the business users, 200,000. My father would have been one of them, by the way, and he would never have let anybody else use that phone, I got to tell you. That was his baby. But they took out all the business users because they reasoned that they couldn't be sure whether they were sharing the phone with other people, OK? So that left their group with about 500,000 people, none of whom used the phone for business, right? 
So Prince Philip would have been one of them if he had lived in Denmark at the time, because he had his own phone too. They defined a user, and I'm not making this up, as someone who made one call a week for six months. Right. They then compared the rates of brain cancer in those who used cell phones prior to 1995, making one call a week for six months, with the rates of brain cancer in all of those who used cell phones later on. Um, Lloyd Morgan and I and some of the world's top epidemiologists have repeatedly asked that question. And we have been told that they did the best they could. <laughs> the study design was paid for by the cell phone industry, and it was designed for not to find anything. Right. Um, but in fairness to my colleagues in epidemiology, epidemiology is not easy to do. Right? And it does, it's kind of like watching the grass grow particularly when you're talking about something like brain cancer, which can have a latency of 40 years. But the fact is, this study keeps getting in, invoked and, and cited as proof that cell phones are safe. And really what it is, it's evidence of how difficult it is to do a good job in epidemiology. I'll grant you that. But here's the, here's the kicker. These are some brand new data on Danish cancer of the brain. And you can see I didn't get to translate it. 2003, 2012, men and women, that sure looks like an increase to me. Like almost 50%, 40% increase. All right, and then here are data in Finland, here are data in Norway. So what do we know? Well, we can't be sure as a scientist, all right? Exposure can't be measured. We don't have good ways to measure it. So we have to estimate it. How much did you use your cell phone 10 years ago, 20 years ago? I, I don't know that I could answer that question. We would like to get billing records, but it so happens as a coincidence that the United States Telecommunications Company, they don't save their billing records. Now, Edward Snowden might know how to get them. <laughs> But researchers who want to study the problem can't. Now, epidemiology was originally cut its teeth on things like smallpox and infectious disease and tuberculosis, things with short latencies where you found some people who were exposed to contaminated drinking water in London during the cholera epidemic and other people who were drinking out of the cleaner water and you compared the rates of death in the two zones and you concluded that there was a significant difference, and you deduced what it was due to, namely the water. Nowadays, epidemiology is wonderful for studying drugs. You take people who have a disease, you give some of them a drug, you give the others a placebo, or you give them the drug and something else, and you see the difference. That's controlled research. We don't have that opportunity with cell phones today. Most of the people in the studies that have been published have defined a user as one call a week for six months. There are no studies of children except for one, which is in fact slightly positive. So we have a mess. What we're trying to do now is ask the question of, well, what can we say with case reports? And I'm going to briefly show you very quickly because I know time is passing and um, there's a lot really don't have adequate time to cover even in several hours. But I'm going to share with you some unusual clinical case reports because in medicine, and how many physicians are here? In medicine, unusual case reports have often been very important for understanding causes of disease. And we are now finding some very unusual types of breast cancer. In young women, we have uh, now seven cases. Two of them are age 21. And this, uh, if we had Wi-Fi here, and you'll have a website we can, we can put the link on, um, this video will show you uh, Lisa Bailey, who is the president of the American Cancer Society of California and the breast surgeon, she's the past president, talking about why she believes these cases of breast cancer are associated with cell phone use. But I'm just going to show you very briefly. Women are keeping breast, uh, cell phones in their bra. They are. All right, it's, um, that you saw that warning that I showed you at the beginning in the iPhone. 
Okay, the younger the breast, the greater the fluid and fat, means more microwave absorption. It's just that simple. Uh, we have five, now we have seven cases. The important thing to tell you is this. <clears throat> These cases have, wherever they kept the phone, the antenna are the sites of the tumors. And uh, the first call I got in 2009 from Robert Nagorny, he said, you're not going to believe this. Uh, I have this Chinese American runner. Those are all very low risk factors for breast cancer. Chinese American runner. And she has tumors right where she kept her phone where she was driving on the freeway back and forth with her three children all day long for eight years. And I, I've never seen anything like this. And um, the woman wanted him to call me and we agreed the first thing she had to do was to get treatment. Her name is Donna Janes and she's become very outspoken about uh, the need to get this information out. And we now have uh, a campaign we call Save the Girls to promote awareness of the fact that this is really uh, very ill-advised. Um, these tumors, uh, one of, I'll show you just this. This is an uh, unbelievable MRI. That's a metastasis. This is a 21-year-old, right where she kept the phone, where the tumor started. Most breast cancers occur in the upper outer quadrant. These are occurring right in the center of the chest, right under the antennas where the phones were stored. And the pathology is unfortunately not unique. It, we would love there to be a marker, you know, that it would be RF associated, but it just looks like ductal carcinoma in situ with cribriform configurations. It's not unusual. It's just that the pattern is unusual. <coughs> Um, and I would add that these cases are all negative for inherited risk, negative for BRCA, no family history, no significant histology, and two of them have metastases. This is the warning, the fine print. I don't know if you can see it from the back, but that's the whole point. This used to be in print with a package with the phone that people threw out. Um, and for the iPhone 4, it did say, iPhone SAR measurement may exceed the FCC exposure guidelines for body-worn operation if positioned less than 15 millimeters from the body, e.g., when carrying the iPhone in your pocket. <clears throat> Don't carry your phone in your pocket. And there are several bra manufacturers that have pockets in their bra. Uh, right. So the BlackBerry comes with advice to keep it, although poor BlackBerry, uh, 7.8 inches from the pacemaker when the BlackBerry device is turned on. If you have a pacemaker, you're supposed to be informed never to keep a cell phone over your heart. Now, this is, I'm sorry, I, I can't believe I brought that thing here and didn't get to show it to you all, but uh, you know, because we'll be back and you can, you, it's, it's uh, thank you. This is a picture of, this is, looks like a toy, but it's actually a teething rattle case for an iPhone, an iPhone, okay? Right over the baby's gonads. And remember, 20 centimeters? This is the American Academy of Pediatrics recommends children under age two have limited to no screen time. There's an iPotty and there's an iBouncy chair. Really, can you just imagine this? If you go to YouTube, you can find videos of a uh, five-month-old baby glued to the iPad doing this, you know, moving it around, and then when you take it away, the baby cries. Well, the opioid receptors are activated by RF. It does seem to stimulate dopamine, which is the, one of the pleasure centers, right? Drugs, sex, rock and roll, and iPads. <laughs> Gambling. Gambling. It, I mean, it, it, it's fun. It's fun. It triggers pleasure centers of the brain. I mean, I'm not telling you that we, we're going to, the genie's not going to go back in the bottle, but let's make the genie a little healthier and safer for all of us. Now, Dr. Taylor, you, this pamphlet I have here is handed out at Yale University and also is in, translated and handed out in Turkey, Finland by their governments on their government websites. I'm thinking that we're going to get there in the United States eventually, and that's why you're here tonight because you're going to help make that happen. 
Um, if I had, if we had a link in here, we could pull this up, but we don't. Correct. All right, um, so because this you won't believe, and I can just do it here. I'll just look for it right now. Smart Life Forum iPad, here we go. I should be, oh, I need the security key. Everybody listen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, 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 nobody jump on because then it won't work. Yeah, right. Write it down or not bring it down. No, no, no. He has to look it up. All right. Say again. C I N D E R. Okay. I don't think it's going to be too much. Here we go. Uh, it's 35 seconds, but it's hard to believe. Um, there is some. This is Markiplier. Everybody look out! This is his channel. Shut up, nerd! He plays games. Oh, hell yeah! Jimmy. Oh no, I killed her. <laughs> Alright, yes. Alright. Now the nice music. one and here's the other um, and there's apps you saw the brain modeling that I showed you before um, you can imagine the exposure given the age and size of that baby This one's hard to imagine. Time to use the potty. <laughs> Be a big boy. You can have a treat. <laughs> Honey, please use the potty for mommy. <sighs> Go on the potty. And you can play with the iPad. mom, I know how difficult potty training can be. Guiding your child's interest and holding their attention long enough to train can be a big challenge. But it can be a little easier now with the brand new iPotty from CTA Digital for the iPad. This potty training seat features a special stand to securely hold the iPad, which kids already love, so they can play with apps, read books, or watch videos, all while potty training. There are even dozens of potty training apps available to help. The adjustable stand can be rotated 360 degrees to switch between horizontal and vertical views and also includes a removable touch screen cover to guard against messy accidents and smudges. The stand can also be adjusted to three positions or removed entirely to transition to the next potty training step or make extra room and easily store away. It's also amazingly simple to keep the iPotty clean and minimize messes with its removable inner potty bowl, potty seat, and splash guard. And if that weren't great enough, it also comes 
comes with a clip-on seat cover that converts the potty to a child activity seat so they can keep having fun with it even after the potty training is over. So take potty training to the next level and make the learning experience easy and fun with CTA 2-in-1 iPotty with activity seat for the iPad. Take it from a mom. Say bye-bye diapers. Hello iPotty. Hello, goodbye, iPotty. <laughs> no, I, I'm uh, obviously, it's funny, but it's sad. As I said at the beginning, we're living in the era of a technological imperative where just because we can do something, we do it. And I think this is an example of a very ill conceived notion. And frankly, I need your help. This is really not uh, something that any one of us can deal with alone. I'm um, about to conclude. South Korea, as you may know, is one of the most sophisticated countries in the world with respect to Wi-Fi and computers. They are based on fiber optic cabling to the home, and they are much more wired than wireless. Even having said that, though, whether wired or wireless, the South Korean neuropsychiatrists are diagnosing increasingly something that they have called digital dementia in their children. And it's characterized by PET scan confirmed, MRI confirmed, defects of development of the right hemisphere and overdevelopment of the left, which means lack of empathy, lack of eye contact, lack of ability to anticipate the consequences of actions. Think about a generation with those characteristics. Based on this, the government in South Korea has actually taken steps. And are any of you Korean? Oh, I'm really hoping. I want to make, I want to make contact with people there because we really we need to learn more about what they're doing and because as a, national, a matter of national priority, they're trying to, to address this growing problem. I know they have more than 100 internet addiction camps in South Korea. And I know that China does also. Internet addiction camps have have sprung up for adults as well as children. So this is a serious global problem. And I'm pleased to say that Environmental Health Trust is working with governments in Turkey. We're working with Governor Asksoy Hussein of Samsung. And he's issued this pamphlet in Turkish. Um, we're working in Belgium with the public health minister. They have banned cell phone sales for children under seven. And in Turkey, you cannot advertise cell phones like you see these things advertised here. Australia's Radiation Protection and Nuclear Safety Agency has created a fact sheet which at least gives more information of the sort that we provide um, on limiting children's exposure to cell phones. The French Health Agency in 2012 concluded after reviewing the evidence that there is evidence for biological effects both in animals and humans. And there's also an increased risk for brain tumors. Therefore, they recommend, as a matter of policy, to limit population exposure, especially for children. Toronto, Canada has limited Wi-Fi in some public parks. And in the US, my hometown of Jackson, Wyoming, has issued cell phone safety awareness. You could do that here right now. Just awareness. Let people be aware. Let people know. The old-fashioned foundation of democracy rests on an informed public that freely consents to be governed. And the basic principle of the right to know is fundamental to democracy. People can't possibly understand the complexities of this technology. But if we, who do understand it, provide information in a way people can comprehend it, I think that will be an important way to move forward to see that we all use technologies in a safer way. In 2013, the city attorney of San Francisco submitted the FCC an appeal to develop new standards. Certainly, the 17-year-old standards are out of date and don't reflect our current understanding of the science. The WHO and Environmental Health Trust and other groups have issued various forms of advice on how to protect your family. Basically, four words. Distance is your friend. Use a speakerphone, use a headset, don't keep the phone on the body, and protect the abdomen of pregnant women or men are wishing to become fathers. Finally, this is our Save the Girls campaign. And we need help in getting the information out. Those of you who are graphic designers or those of you who have access to a 
printing machines that can make copies that we can distribute. We're looking for partners to do that. And I leave you with these words from Albert Einstein. The world is not dangerous because of those who do harm, but because of those who look at it without doing anything. Thank you very much. We usually take a break between speakers, but yep. I just want to ask you, because I'm sure we have questions for Deborah. I'm fine. Well, we have no other speakers. I'm fine. Take a break and then ask your questions. Does right. that work for you? Whatever you want to do is fine. Let's do that. Let's take a 10 minute break and come back. And come get our materials to give away. Yep. And right. the books are here again for purchase $15, right. and there's some pamphlets here as well. Yes, I know. Right. After the break, I'll show this.